In this video, we'll discuss global trends in urbanization and how they intersect with the growing population. When we talk about urbanization, we're talking about cities, but the precise definition of what is urban isn't that clear. This photo of Seattle, Washington clearly is an urban setting, and in most cases, the definition refers to any cities or towns of more than 5,000 people. There are three things that I want to go through in this video. First, we're going to look at how urban and rural populations have changed over time and how they're projected to change into the future. We'll then look at why the world's populations are moving into urban areas and what factors are driving those changes. Lastly, we'll briefly touch on the implications of an increasingly urban world. The world has changed quite a lot from 1950 to the present. Only 30% of the global population lived in urban areas in 1950. That means that 70% of people lived in rural areas that were outside of the cities and towns that we're all familiar with now. Today, that number globally is about 55%. But as we'll look at in a couple of slides, that number varies a lot from country to country. The statistic that is really surprising comes from the United Nations, where the projection is that 68% of the global population will be in cities by 2050. A huge fraction of that population will live in what are called megacities, some of which will exceed 20 million people. As you see in these graphs, there are two patterns happening simultaneously. First, the global population is increasing, and so both rural and urban curves have been going up for the last 70 years. But what's really notable here is that over the next 30 years, the projections say that people will actually leave rural areas and move to cities. More on that in a little bit. If we look around the world today, we see massive differences across countries in the proportion of people that live in cities. As you can see in this map, the urban areas of the United States, Europe, and a number of other countries exceed 80% of the population living in urban settings. For the United States, that number is 82% in 2017. Most of Europe is about 80 to 85% urban. Australia is a massive country, but it's about 85% urban. Japan and Argentina are two of the highest, most urbanized countries. 90% of their populations live in cities. In contrast, large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia have much lower numbers. Niger, the light-colored country just below the Sahara Desert, has only about 16% of its population in cities. In East Africa, Kenya, despite Nairobi, which is a massive city, is overall only 26% urban. India is just 30% urban, despite very large and vibrant cities across the country. The patterns on this graph show a complex set of changes that happen across the different types of economies on the planet. One of the most simple ways to distinguish countries is by their income level. And a common delineation is between the high income countries, which include places like the United States, France, Europe, so on. In the middle and in income countries, China is a good example of a middle income country. And one of the interesting points about these types of countries is that they can often be a mix of the very high income settings you'd find in some place like Europe, and more, much lower income settings you might find in rural Africa. The lower income countries, or the low income countries, include many of the sub-Saharan African countries, with the exception of South Africa, and a handful of South Asian countries. If we look at the patterns here, you see the colored lines, which are all urban populations in the three different income groups. And you see that in the high income countries have had a steady but not dramatic increase in urban population. That's the pink line here. And it's good to remember that the population of the high-income countries is much lower than that of the middle and low-income countries. The really striking pattern here is in the urbanization of the middle-income countries, shown by the blue line, and in the corresponding decline in rural populations, shown by the highest gray line. In these countries, including China, there has been a movement of people from rural areas to urban centers. In the lowest-income countries, you can see the projected increase in urban populations as we move toward 2050, as shown in the red line. The causes of urbanization are complex, but there is one factor that is particularly important to mention, and which seems to be part of the pattern across the world. This is summarized on the right, and the point is that as agriculture changes in ways that become more industrialized and less oriented around family farms, rural economies change, and in many cases economic opportunity in those settings becomes more restricted. You can think about this in the United States, where much of our early economic development centered around agriculture. In the 1800s, owning land and growing food was a common occupation and a major part of the economy. Today, the U.S. economy is dominated by industries like service and technology that are located usually in cities. 
The same type of pattern has occurred or is occurring around the world. And in this graph, you can see a relatively strong correlation between the employment rate in agriculture and the percent of the population that lives in urban areas. Countries with very little agriculture employment also tend to be very urbanized. One of the other important things to know about this broad type of economic change is how it plays out in some of the poorest countries on the planet. For most of human history, farms were small, and it's only in the last 70 years and mostly in the wealthy countries where this has changed. Around the world today, and particularly in the low and middle income countries, there are many people who continue to make a living through agriculture. And in most cases, these are farmers that have only a few acres of land, and they're often called smallholder farmers. There are about 800 million people worldwide that make their living this way, and most live on under $2 a day in income, at or below the World Bank poverty line. In these locations, farming provides an important service in food production, but it's often a marginal economic activity. You can probably imagine that young people trying to figure out what to do might want to move from these settings to cities in search of better jobs, access to education, and improved economic opportunity. I can tell you from personal experience taking an Uber or Lyft ride around Nairobi, Kenya, that many young people have stories of moving from the family farm to the city in search of opportunity. As you imagine, those opportunities can be hard to come by, but the prospects at home on the farm can also be dire. As we look around the world, as shown in this figure, we see a strong correlation between the percentage of people living in urban areas and the per capita gross domestic product, which is a measure of the total national economy normalized to the total population of a country. You could look at this graph and hypothesize that urbanization drives economic development or that economic development leads to urbanization. And there are debates about these issues in the economic and development literature. But there is also another important point to note here, which is that in general, cities have improved sanitation, drinking water access, nutrition, and improved economic opportunity compared to rural areas. So aside from everything else, cities can draw people in for a variety of reasons. From an environmental perspective, you might wonder whether urbanization is a good thing or a bad thing. And like many things in environmental science, the answer is a little bit of both. The two photos here will give you a sense of why urbanization can be a positive for the environment or a negative. The presence of mass transportation versus personal cars in wealthy countries can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and people in urban settings also tend to live in smaller homes than in rural or suburban areas. That colorful photo is actually a high-rise in Hong Kong, and there are hundreds of people in just the windows you can see in, the, in that particular image. The downsides of urbanization include air pollution, traffic, congestion, and economic segregation, especially in developing economies, where wealth discrepancies can be very large and also very obvious in urban settings. To wrap up, it's clear that the world is becoming increasingly urban, and this seems likely to continue. Economics, and more specifically economic opportunity, is one of the key factors driving urbanization and specifically the movement away from agriculturally driven economies to more diversified service and manufacturing oriented economies. It's also clear that urbanization itself changes the way that economies work. More on that in the next video. Lastly, urbanization is neither good nor bad. It's just a trend, albeit, albeit a very important one for understanding environmental change. Urbanization can have some positive benefits on the environment, um, but it can also lead to air pollution and other environmental issues that we continue to deal with around the world today. And this is really where the science and the facts of this issue give way to the policies and decision making that determine just what kind of cities we're all going to live in as we approach the middle of the 21st century.